your brothers shall praise you. Genesis 49 and verse 8. And thus the name Judah originally was associated with praise. And he was praised in that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. How ironic, ironic that is by the actions of one whose name later, who bore that name later, uh, that it should forever be associated with shame when it was anything but that before. But that tells us how people's names often are affected. And so the Judas we'll be considering in this course of study, of course, was the son of Simon Iscariot, his name given in John chapter 6. The word Iscariot in most translations is a word that's generated a fair amount of speculation by some of the scholars, although some have tried to trace the roots of this word back to the concept of a man of lies, dagger bearer, some of the other most likely explanation is, is that it was simply the name of the town he was from. And uh, there were towns, often people would be get named after a town. Jesus was to be called a Nazarene, it says. Somebody from Memphis is a Memphian, and so on. Most scholars identify that town as Kiriath, located in the district around Jerusalem, one of the smaller towns. Today that town doesn't exist anymore, but if this was, in fact, the home of Judas and his family, then that would make this particular disciple the only one of the apostles who was a Judean. And all the others were from Galilee. And the only Galilean among the non-Galilean, among the twelve, would be Judas. Apart from that, and of course some of that is speculation, nothing further is known about his background, about his upbringing, about his family. None of those things were told in the Bible. Those weren't significant to the Bible story. The Bible doesn't tell us everything we would like to know. It tells us what we need to know. And there are a lot of things that maybe farther along we'll find out about. And uh, we'd probably like to know more about Judas, but that's what we know. In the various listings of the 12 within the New Covenant documents, the name of Judas always appears last. His name always appears in the last. Anytime you read a list of those names. And additionally, there's added to his name some brief, usually very negative, characterization, as in Matthew chapter 10, the one who betrayed him. So his name mentioned last, and then this phrase is added to it. And then we have who also betrayed him in Mark 3 and verse 19. Uh, in Luke, we have who became a traitor, Luke 6, 16. John 6, verse 70, one of you is a devil. And he was describing Judas. He's called a thief in John 12 and verse 6. And he's called the son of perdition in John 17 and verse 12. So those are several names that are given to Judas, or several descriptions given to Judas. And uh, it's as though the gospel writers couldn't paint him dark enough, picture him dark enough. They all had some phrase to say about him. It was always a negative, always a bad thing. And there are 40 verses in the New Testament in which there are references to the betrayal of Jesus. And in each one of them, this sin of Judas is recorded. And so that's something to think about as we proceed in our study. Some scholars wishing to find something positive in it all suggest that our Lord Jesus, who knew the character of Judas from the first, uh, we're told in John chapter 6, he saw him in the material out of which an apostle might have been made. In other words, Jesus saw the potential in Judas. Judas was not a devil from the beginning, as some people have taught. And the reason there's a motive behind teaching it that way, because it fits in with a doctrine, the doctrine of once saved, always saved, because we often point out that Judas... The Bible says, by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place in Acts 1, in verse 26. And some say, well, Judas never was saved to begin with. Well, he never was saved, and he couldn't fall, could he? But the Bible says he fell by transgression, by sin, by violating the will of God. 
And the Bible tells us there was a point at which Satan entered into Judas. That means before that happened, he wasn't in Judas. So Judas was an apostle, one whom Jesus thought met the qualifications of what he thought would make a good apostle, and he was chosen as one. And there was a point in time in which the devil entered into him. He was not a devil from the beginning, as some have said. And we've heard that said so often, and it almost sounds like it's in the Bible somewhere, but it's not. It's not there at all. And so surely one would think that at least the potential for spiritual greatness that was within this man uh, would have shown at some time. After all, when Jesus sent his disciples out, he gave them miraculous power, even of raising the dead. And Judas was one of those who was given that power. We don't know of any examples where he ever used it. We're not told everything the apostles did. Uh, it's possible that he used it, and we're simply not aware of it, but he was among those who was given that. And let's keep in mind also that Judas is not the only one of the twelve that had any kind of a problem. There were other members of the twelve that also had personal failings. In fact, they were all flawed. Everybody in the lineage of Jesus was flawed, except Jesus, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus was aware of something in each one of them that if nurtured could be utilized to the glory of God. I think we see that with James and John. At one time early on, they apparently had a short fuse. They had very explosive tempers. And when there was one city that kind of rejected them, James and John suggested, let's call fire down from heaven and burn them up. And that wasn't the will of Jesus to do that. Later on, Particularly, John became known as John the Beloved, the one who reclined on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. So people can change. Some people change for the better, some for the worse. I think James and John are some that change for the better. Peter is one that changed for the better. But Judas was not. He didn't change for the better. And so anyway, Jesus chose people that would be could be utilized in spreading the borders of the kingdom, furthering the kingdom upon the earth. And Judas must have had that potential. And it's worth noting that in keeping, uh, in keeping with that view, that in the early phrase of, excuse me, the early phase of the Lord's ministry, that there's nothing stated in Scripture that suggested that Judas was anything but or other than an active, obedient disciple of Christ. And he, along with the other 11 men, was commissioned to preach the word and was given authority to cast out demons. Well, if Judas was given the authority to cast out demons, then he was not a devil from the beginning. But he was given the authority to cast them out. He was apparently quite successful at doing both of those. The apostles went about doing that. And thus Judas Iscariot preached the good news. He even confirmed the message with signs that followed, the Bible says the gospel was confirmed by miraculous signs, and Judas was among those doing that. He made a personal sacrifice to be an apostle. All of the apostles made personal sacrifices to be apostles. Peter said, we've given up all. And he was referring to all the, 12, all the apostles to engage in that ministry just as the others did. And yes, there was definitely something of worth in this man, and a potential for even greater service in the kingdom of God. Now, we previously noted that Judas was flawed. He was less than perfect. But then, realistically, all of us are less than perfect. And we have flaws. And we're certainly not attempting to make excuses for Judas. We're just stating a fact that the Bible states. And all of the Lord's servants have within them the potential for either faithfulness or failure. That potential lies there all the time. And this was no less true of Judas. And one of the major besetting sins of this man, and one which may very well have contributed greatly to his act of betrayal, was his apparent greed and love for money. Because we have uh, uh, other occasions mentioned that involve that particular uh, attitude of the love of money. We know from Scripture that Judas was the group's treasurer. He was the one entrusted with their money, according to John 12 and verse 6, and John 13, verse 29. 
And there were several saints who, had, who were contributing to the support out of their private means. Uh, some of the women apparently were supporting the ministry of Jesus. And thus there was a need for somebody to look after and to administer those funds and to take care of them and, and uh, spend them when they needed to spend them. And that job fell to Judas. We don't know how he was selected for that, but he was selected and perhaps he had even requested it. We don't know. We're not told how he came to be in possession of the money bag. But what we do know tragically is that periodically he was helping himself to those funds and uh, indeed he let the later statement to the religious leaders reflect his greediness when he went to them and he said, what are you willing to give me to deliver him to you? That tells us something about a problem that he had, about greed, about a love for money. And so he's willing to bargain uh, monetarily to turn Jesus over to them. And, and that tells us a whole lot right there. In response to that question, it says they weighed out to him 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces. People who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts, such as drown men in destruction and perdition, and many have been led astray from the faith. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some reaching after have been led astray from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And Judas, of course, is one among many who have fallen into that. The brother of our Lord writes, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But Paul and James could easily have had Judas in mind when penning those words as being examples of the very thing they're talking about. We don't know. But in spite of his special calling from Jesus, Jesus called the apostles. So in spite of Judas' special calling from Jesus, the Son of God, and his privileged position of being among the twelve, I say privilege, they, they may not have looked at it as a privilege considering all that happened to them, but the amount of good that he must have accomplished at least early in the ministry and in the lives of other people through preaching the good news and performing miracles and all that, Judas Iscariot will forever be remembered for just one thing. We don't remember him for the good that he had done up to that point. We don't remember him for the miraculous ability that God gave him through Jesus Christ to even raise the dead. And so there's a lesson here. We note in the, uh, perhaps a quote from Shakespeare in Julius Caesar. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is off interred within their bones. And what that simply means is that no matter how much good you accomplish in your life, people tend to remember the evil. And so it was with Judas. When I mention the name Richard Nixon, what comes to mind? Well, everybody thinks of the same thing. Watergate, resigning the presidency. And how, can, how many can remember the good he did that he accomplished before that? And he did do some good. And so that's the same thing is true, true of Judas Iscariot. And so we, may we live in such a way that uh, such will not be true of us. Well, that was a sad legacy that he left. Also, the Bible teaches that Judas betrayed Jesus into the hands of his accusers. For 30 pieces of silver, somebody once noted, never was so little paid for so much. Never was so little paid for so much. 30 pieces of silver was the amount representative of something that was of very little worth. Indeed, in Zechariah chapter 11, we see the people rejecting the Lord as the shepherd. And one would think that people would be thrilled to have the Lord as their shepherd watching over them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. David the psalmist talked about the Lord being his shepherd, and he counted it a fortunate thing. But you would think people would be thrilled at that. But David was probably the only one among many. When they asked what all this was worth in their sight, it says, they weighed out for me my wages, 30 pieces of silver. That's a messianic prophecy there in Zechariah chapter 11. That was the price, according to Exodus chapter 21, verse 32, that was the price of a gored slave, a slave that had been injured. That's what Jesus was sold for. 
And Judas was willing to sell out the good shepherd for a pittance. It wasn't much at all. And that's pitiful. And before we get too smug or too harsh on Judas, we need to ask ourselves, what place, where, what's, what's our place in regard to loyalty to Jesus? And what's our price? We might ask that question. What's our price? What would it take for you to sell out the good shepherd? We don't like to think about that, but Judas had his price tag. I fear many do even today as well. And the frightening reality is, there but for the grace of God go I. Now then, we want to notice the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. First of all, some things that we might say about it. One thing, it was a cowardly thing. It was cowardly. And he began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the multitude. We're told in Luke 22 and verse 6. So Judas was looking for an opportunity to figure out how to do this. And so after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately. The Bible says it was night in John 13 and verse 30. Those who betray others are cowards. That's doing something behind your back. It's pretending to be one way to your face and the opposite behind your back. And so they may hide in dark, dark corners from prying eyes and look for opportunities. Also, we might say another word we might attribute to this it was calculated. It wasn't just something that happened all of a sudden that he fell into before he realized it. It was calculated. It says, and from then on, he began looking for an opportunity to betray him, Matthew 16, Matthew 26, 16. And he began seeking how to betray him at, at an opportune time, Mark 14, verse 11. He went away. He discussed it with the chief priests and the officers, how he might go about doing this. And he came up with the idea, the one whom I kiss, that'll be the one. So it was calculated. And they began seeking for opportunity. It was also callous, without feeling. And it says, now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, he is the one, sees him. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. Well, that was as hypocritical as it could be. It was very callous, too. It showed no feeling for what he was doing. I don't know how much Judas understood about what the future held. Possibly he didn't foresee how it was going to end. But anyway, that's what we're told. But now we want to raise the question, why? Why did he do it? There are a number of questions uh, involving the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. Some are curious about the subsequent response of this man. Did he genuinely repent of his deed? We'll talk about that later. Was he ultimately saved or lost? And some people have questions regarding the nature of his death. Others are, others are puzzled about the whole predestination issue. Was he predestined to do this? And so we're going to examine these in the course of our study and and the question that seems to be uppermost in everybody's mind is, why did he do it? Why did he do it? What could possibly have motivated Judas to do what he did? Kind of like we do about Adam and Eve. Why did they do that? Why did they eat the fruit? Several theories have been proposed. We want to look at each one of them uh, briefly. Over the years, one of them is the good motive theory. In this theory, we find the betrayal to be a matter of, of poor judgment on the part of Judas. And some have said, taken that and said, well, he just used poor judgment. And certainly not evil, evil intent on his part. It was just bad judgment. And so he's actually characterized as a patriotic nationalist who expected Jesus to lead the Jews to victory over the Roman uh, occupation forces and thus restoring the kingdom of Israel. There are a lot of people who had that idea in the first century. And that's what they expected. Even some after the resurrection still were expecting that kind of a thing. But Judas perceived Jesus to be somewhat reluctant, and I'm still talking about that theory, that Judas perceived Judas to be somewhat reluctant to initiate such an uprising. So Judas wanted to help it along. And uh, he per perceived that Jesus was hesitant and maybe timid 
and thus he was delaying what needed to be accomplished. And so the theory is that Judas felt that it kind of forced his hand. He forced Jesus' hand by doing this, by putting his life in risk, serious risk, and that he would finally act to rally the troops before it all came to that point. That maybe Judas had that idea. We don't know. Judas Iscariot acted not from treachery, they would say, or any bad motives, but from an honest endeavor to arouse Jesus to action and to hasten his messianic triumph. That's trying to put the best interpretation on what Judas did. It's called the good motive. And there have always been those who felt that Judas got a bum deal. And from the historians, both biblical and secular, that he was only trying to move things along a bit and was viewed, uh, Jesus was maybe viewed by others as somewhat wishy-washy and reluct a reluctant Messiah who needed to be given a push. And if you get away from the scriptures, don't, don't tell them where you'll wind up. And you could perhaps take an idea like that. But there were some people early on, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and others who spoke of, spoke of a group known as the Cainites, who actually viewed the conduct, uh, conduct of Judas as meritorious and even suggesting that, uh, that he sought to be the Savior. And thus Judas was surprised along with everybody else when this plan to hasten the coming of the kingdom resulted instead of uh, being something totally different, the crucifixion of Jesus, and that he did, that didn't anticipate that outcome. That's one motive. I'm only stating what people have said in the past about this. Another one is the mingled motive theory. And this particular main, this th theory maintains that Judas like most people, was a very complex individual and that his, his act was motivated by a combination of factors, uh, greed being one of them, obviously, ambition, uh, misguided loyalty, nationalistic fervor, disillusionment, maybe even jealousy over the fact that being the only non-Galilean of the Twelve, that he was not, in his view, being shown equal consideration by Jesus, and these are, as well as many other possible motivators, have been suggested over the years as possible things that facilitated the actions of Judas against Christ. That theory is based partly on the assumption that ultimate truth generally lies somewhere between two extremes, and therefore, rather than his act being perceived as either fully negative or fully positive, that in nature it most likely was somewhere in between. <laughs> Uh, but the two, which would logically suggest a mingling of motives, some good, some bad. A third view is the direct request theory. Many have uh, heard of the Gnostics. The Gnostics aren't mentioned by name in the Bible, but we see particularly John in the, in the epistles of John dealing with Gnostic doctrines uh, that are taught there, known as the, uh, there's a book that was uh, brought to light, or re-brought to light, it's always been out there, uh, the Gospel of Judas. A few years ago, we were talking about that book, and I remember preaching a sermon about the time that that was being uh, popularized. National Geographic uh, Society had a rather impressive presentation of that, both in their publication and on their TV channel. And that action document, although far from inspired, far from meeting the criteria for being in the canon of the scriptures, nevertheless portrays a view that has been in existence for many centuries. And in the view, in the days prior to the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus took Judas Iscariot aside and requested that he betray him into the hands of the Jewish leaders. In other words, it was a conspiracy that Jesus was involved in and that Judas didn't perform this act on his own initiative, that he was following the orders of Jesus himself. Now that requires quite an imagination, but there were some people who thought that at one time. And so in this document, Judas is portrayed as Jesus' closest friend and the one whom our Lord confided in his very deepest secrets and that Jesus warned Judas that in carrying out his request, he was going to be vilified by all men. And that Judas was told this ahead of time. Nevertheless, the Lord asked Judas to make that sacrifice, and in doing this, that he eventually would be exalted in the spirit realm. And so 
Near the end of the Gospel of Judas, Jesus says, But you will exceed all of them, for you will sacrifice the man that clothes me. And one of the commentators on that, who was the leader of the translation team for the Gospel of Judas, he offered this explanation. He said, Jesus says it's necessary for someone to free him finally from his human body, and he prefers that this liberation be done by a friend rather than by an enemy. So he asked Judas, who is his friend, to sell him out to betray him. And you can detect Gnostic theology all the way through that document, even in the statement by Jesus to Judas, in which he requests to be set free from the prison of his flesh, which was clearly Gnostic doctrine. And so, as wild as that theory may seem to most of us, nevertheless, there has been a growing interest uh, due to the publicity being given to it by the National Geographic and also by a movie that became very popular that was out a few years ago, The Da Vinci Code uh, by Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code. It was a book and a movie. It sold, the book sold 80 million copies, so it wasn't a minor uh, seller. And it was sold in 43, published in 43 different languages back in 2003, not that long ago. And, of course, it had a famous star in it. Harrison Ford was the main star, and so it caught on. A lot of people got interested in that. It's based on the so-called Gospel of Judas. And, uh, of course, it didn't meet any of the qualifications for being in the canon. But anyway, that's another one of the theories as to why Judas might have done that. There's another one, and that's we've touched on this one already, the Satan incarnate theory that he was a devil from the beginning. Some have actually gone so far to ma maintain that Judas was not truly human uh, or that he was only partly human and being Satan incarnate. And so just as goodness took on human form, so also did evil in the body of G Judas. And so thus Judas was the flesh and blood manifestation of the devil. That's what some have believed, just as Jesus was the flesh and blood manifestation of his father. And so those two great cosmic forces assumed the form of flesh at the same time to do battle with one another in the physical realm. John 6 and verse 70 is cited as proof of this view. Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Those are the words of Jesus in John 7 and verse 60. And so just as the demons recognized Judas for who he was, so also did Jesus recognize them and also their master Satan when he saw them. And thus he said to have welcomed Satan in the form of Judas into his band of disciples so as to daily do battle with him. It's a far out theory, but there are people who believe that. And then another one, that Judas was the puppet of God, that God just created him for this purpose, to use him to accomplish this. And that's one of the more popular theories, especially among those who happen to be more of a Calvinistic persuasion, is that Judas Iscariot had been chosen specific for, specific, specifically for this not long before he was even born, or for that role before he was even born, and thus this poor man was doomed from the beginning and uh, to be the betrayer, and uh, he was doomed to hell from the very beginning of time is what Calvinists would teach about that, that he was predestined and it's declared that he had no choice in the matter. He was simply a puppet on a string, manipulated by the great puppet master. People who believe that. Many of them Calvinistic in their persuasion. Well, if that view is true, and I don't accept it for a moment, but if it's true, that raises some very serious questions about God, doesn't it? And about his dealings with mankind. And uh, it puts it all at risk. <laughs> And so do we have free will or not? Or is our fate determined before we were ever conceived? If Judas's fate was determined before he was ever conceived, then why not the rest of us? If God is not a respecter of persons, then where does that make it fall? Well, it certainly complicates things, doesn't it? And then the latter would appear that God has already chosen those whom he will save, and that can't be changed, and...
those whom he, he will condemn, and that can't be changed, and that we have absolutely nothing to do with the matter, that we cannot affect our eternal outcome in any way. It's already been decided before the foundation of the world. Why bother proclaiming the gospel to the lost if the eternal destiny has already been fixed for everybody? Why bother? Well, nobody's ever given a good answer for that. I've never heard a good answer for it. If our eternal destiny has already been determined. Did Judas have a choice or was his destiny fixed? Was it fixed? Well, we want to talk a little bit about some things that relate to that. Did Judas have a choice? And we want to look at some words. The word foreknowledge. We often talk about foreknowledge. What does it mean to have foreknowledge? It means knowing something before it occurs. There are several times we see in the Bible where uh, God or Christ or in some cases even inspired prophets as well saw something before it occurred. They even spoke of it as though it, it had happened, although it was yet hundreds of years in the future. And so the word foreknowledge means exactly what it says. To know something before it occurs, it doesn't suggest that something is manipulated or that it is ordained. That's a different word. When we talk about foreordination or predestination, we're not using the same word here, foreknowledge. And foreknowledge simply signifies prior knowledge of the matter. doesn't mean you caused it. And so God being outside of space and time has perfect knowledge of the past, present, and future if he so chooses. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He can choose to know something. He can choose not to know if he wants to. Then a second word that we've already made mention of, the word predetermination, and like the word foreknowledge, it means just exactly what it says, to determine something well in advance of its actual occurrence. It has been previously determined, in other words. And these two terms are used together in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Peter, speaking of Jesus, said, This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So you have both words used there in Peter's sermon. God foreknew that a sacrifice was going to be needed to atone for the sins of mankind. And he determined from the very beginning what that plan of action would be. And therefore the shed blood of the Son of God on the cross was both foreknown and predetermined by the Father. Peter says that in his sermon. But then there's another word, and that's the word predestination. And there's differences between these words. We need to understand them. Predestination is the term often confused with predetermination. They're not the same word. They don't mean the same thing. Two concepts are not the same. Uh, many mistakenly believe that if someone is predestined, that their fate is sealed and they're helpless to alter their destiny, that they can't alter it. That's not the case. A person still has the right to choose. And this term simply signifies that the ultimate outcome of one's choices have previously uh, established by God. For example, if you choose to accept God's Son, then you'll experience eternal life, a destiny that's been previously established for those who freely choose Him. So we're predestined in that sense. God has predestined everybody that obeys the gospel to be saved and everybody that doesn't to be lost. That doesn't mean he decided by name and by number before the foundation of the world whether John Doe or whether Dick Blackford was going to be saved or lost, but simply he decided that this category of people, everybody that obeys the gospel will be saved and those who don't will be lost. So uh, if you choose to reject God's Son, that God has previously established a destiny for you, not because of who you are, but because of the choice you made, because of that choice. And so in this sense, there is predetermination involved. And uh, for all men who have ever lived and the, those yet to be born are going to experience one of two eternal destinies that we're told about in the Bible. Everlasting life or everlasting death, separation from God. And there's not a third option available. And these destinies have been predetermined by God. And 
which one we experience hasn't yet been predetermined. It depends on the choices we make in life. And so that depends on our choice. God knows, but he doesn't determine our choices. Let's notice another phrase, and that's the phrase free will. And that's simply the freedom to make a choice. The freedom to choose. And either men have the freedom to choose their own destiny or they're puppets too. We're all just puppets if we don't have free will. We have been pre-programmed uh, like a computer or like a robot if that's the case. And we don't really have any ability at all. And so we need to think about that. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. We're told excuse me, in John 6 and verse 64. But the decision to betray Jesus was made by Judas alone. Nobody made it for him. <clears throat> and it's my conviction that the best theory as to why Judas betrayed the Lord is probably the mingled motive theory that we mentioned earlier, that there were undoubtedly, as in most men, a, a variety of passions pervading the heart and mind of a disciple. Even Judas may have not fully perceived the various inner stirrings that motivated him and the possible outcomes that would, would uh, thus transpire after all of that. But although greed was certainly a strong one, we see evidence of that. That was a strong one. Undoubtedly, this is a common defense mechanism. And Judas had found some way to justify his sinful action in his own mind, and we often do this ourselves, and may not have even perceived his action against Christ as a true betrayal. He may have rationalized it, as we sometimes do, at least not initially. And as stated in that good motive theory, he may well have been some good coming from his action. After all, when Judas, Jesus told the 12 at the last Passover meal, one of you will betray me in Matthew 26, 21. Each one of them began to say, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Jesus said it would be the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl. Verse 23. At which point Judas exclaimed, surely not I, Rabbi. Judas said that. Verse 25. And although we can't be sure, some even feel that Judas was somewhat self-deluded as to the negative impact that his actions were about to have on Jesus, that he couldn't foresee how this thing was going to turn out. It's quite possible he had convinced himself that he, it was not a betrayal, but that it would all turn out for the best in some way. It's going to turn out for the best. And if he had this misconception about the coming of the kingdom and Jesus just needed to be pushed to force his hand, that uh, he could have put a good interpretation on what he was doing at that point. And so sometimes people do that kind of thing to justify their sin. They rationalize. We've been in the shoes of Judas maybe more times than we'd like to admit in trying to rationalize something. And uh, uh, even re-crucifying the Son of God afresh, as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6. So those are some terms we've looked at. But let's talk about something else, and let's talk about loving like Jesus. We want to pause and shift our focus to Jesus for uh, these last few minutes. The way in which he interacted with Judas, when you stop and think about it, is really phenomenal. It's really phenomenal. We, we might notice this excerpt from a book, The Day Christ Died, released back in 1957, written by Jim Bishop. He said, the mind of Jesus could look into the heart of Judas and see every scar every soil tissue, but he would say nothing hurtful to this man even when he knew that Judas was stealing from the common purse, even when he knew that Iscariot no longer believed in Jesus. Love, it required a unique devotion to continue to address this person as an apostle, to refrain at all times from showing a mark of disfavor, to be able to do it so well that at the Last Supper the others could not guess the name of the traitor, and had to ask one after another, is it I, Lord, is it I? Well, and then Bishop goes on to say, he did it, and all the time he knew. 
if love, which is a perpetual act of selfless devotion, could be molded into arms and legs and sinew and features and brain, the result would be Jesus of Nazareth. And I believe that's a, a profound statement and one that we need to consider. So what is it that sets our Lord apart from all the rest of the world in that he did not react to people, but he related to them? That's what Jesus did. That's what made him different. He didn't react to people. He related to them. And we see that in his dealings with Judas. So much so that the other apostles could not guess which one it was. Jesus never did anything to indicate or to give a hint that the others could point their finger at somebody else. It's to be said that to their credit that they didn't say, is it Judas or is it James or is it Bartholomew? No, they each want to ask, is it I? And so that's to be said to their credit. So that's one of the things that sets our Lord apart. And as we think about that, to display love for another, even when we know their flaws and their failures, even when they may not love us in return, is to love as he loved. That's the way Jesus loved. He's the perfect example of that. Well, in our remaining moments, we want to talk about the distress and death of Judas. How did Judas die? There are not two accounts of his death. Some have thought there are two accounts, uh, uh, different, two different accounts. There are two places where it's referred to. One of them says he went out and hanged himself. Another one says uh, that he fell headlong and his bowels burst asunder. That's in Acts. Uh, apparently that was something that happened later. Both of them are true. He did go out and hang himself, and at some time either the rope broke or something happened and he fell. And after a while, of course, the body would have swelled up and he fell and he burst asunder. And we find those two accounts in Matthew tw chapter 27 and Acts chapter 1. And so a lot of speculation about those. There doesn't need to be. Uh, did he commit suicide by hanging himself or was his death a grief-induced strangulation. Some have suggested that. Did Judas betrent, uh, repent of his betrayal before he died? The Bible says in Matthew 27, verses 3 through 5, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned and was full of remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What's that to us? See thou to it. And he threw the silver down in the sanctuary and departed. Then he went and hanged himself, the Bible says. Maybe Judas didn't foresee this outcome, that it would go this far, because he appears to be trying to undo it, doesn't he, when he brings the money back, and he wants to undo it. Uh, no deal. The deal's off. I don't want to go through with this. That's what Judas is saying. And so uh, my view is that Judas did not anticipate it going that far. And when it didn't, went too far, and when he lost control of the situation, this was the only thing he knew to do. He had such awful shame because of that. But the word repent, the Bible says Judas repented and then went out and hanged himself. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. Is not the word repent, mentaneo, like in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, but it means an aftercare or a regret that he was annoyed by the consequences. He didn't want it to turn out this way, and he regretted it. But it wasn't a godly repentance that would bring about a changed life, like happened to the apostle Peter. Peter had sinned grievously too, hadn't he, in denying the Lord three times. But Peter got it straightened out. He got it right. Judas didn't. Judas didn't. He could have. He could have repented in the true sense of the term, but he was greatly distressed over the uh, results of his, the outcome of his actions, so distressed that he cast the money down and went out and hanged himself. And falling headlong, the Bible says, he burst in the middle, his bowels gushed out. Rather graphic description. The Lord did it that way for a purpose. And so we should not criticize any. Sometimes there's some scriptures that are very graphic and very sickening. They're there for a purpose us to realize the seriousness and the gravity of those situations. Following his death, Judas was 
buried. We've already raised a question about whether he repented. The Valley of Hinnom is a valley, a very deep valley, on the kind of the southeastern side of the city of Jerusalem. You can walk down it today. It's, uh, it's the, one of the deepest. You just keep walking down, down. You think you're never going to get to the bottom. You just keep winding. It keeps going down and down farther and farther. This was the same valley in the Old Testament where Israel, when they were in apostasy from the Lord, worshipped Molech in the Valley of Hinnom. Same place. The Valley of Hinnom is seen from the air and uh, up to the top left corner there would be uh, toward the Mount of Olives and you would walk down there and you can't tell it, but those trails going down are descending rapidly. You're going downhill. It's quite a walk coming back up out of there because it's pretty steep coming back up out of there. And then there's another picture of the Valley of Hinnom and just put those in there for you to see where that happened. And uh, many fascinating myths and legends about Judas that have been associated with him, even among Muslims and others. We won't go into all that, but have you ever met anybody by the name of Judas? I never have. Never have. What about the name Jezebel? Have you ever met anybody by that name? I never have. There are probably a few out there, but generally such names are associated with such great shame that most people don't give their children names like that, and they're shunned. To be called a Judas or a Jezebel are insults of the highest order in almost any place. And so people don't name their children after that. What a tragedy it is that that name that started out meaning something good, this time I will praise the Lord, and she named him Judah. And then it turns out like this. So what a tragedy that that is. And yet to be giving in to his own lust, he cast it away, the 30 pieces of silver. What a waste of life. And so we don't need that set of us. You know what Jesus said about Judas? It would have been better if he had never been born. It would have been better if he had never been born because of his outcome. Not because he was predestined. The possibility of true repentance was available for Judas just as much as it was for Peter. But because he made the wrong choice, it was better that he had never been born. Did you know that anybody that does not obey the gospel, that same thing can be said about them? If you don't obey the gospel, it would have been better if you hadn't been born because of what's in store for those who obey not the gospel. The Bible says the Lord will be revealed in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. This evening, if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, God has given you a wonderful opportunity to become a Christian and to glorify Christ through that name. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Because of such a wonderful example they were in that church. Every good thing said about that church is good. Makes a great lesson, a great sermon in and of itself. But if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you need to do that. It's urgent that you do it because of the terrible outcome if you don't. And we've already talked about that. You need to repent and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. The Lord will forgive you. You'll be happy and glad you did. And everybody but the devil will rejoice. Will you come?